All right, everybody. It's me, Mr. Heisey. I'm going to try to do this in one take. It's probably going to be a mess, but we'll give it a shot. Let's go. The digestive system is all about trying to take large organic materials from the environment and breaking it down into smaller, more absorbable units. When we talk about small absorbable units, really we're talking about food on the molecular scale. You know, we're trying to break down proteins into like amino acids, for example. That's something that your body is able to go and use and absorb and put into other types of molecules. Here's a gross picture of a snake eating a mouse. All right. Um... Now, just to kind of mark this right off the beginning here, there are actually some animals, whales are a great example of this, they kind of take advantage of the normal food chain thing where we see the bottom of a food chain, the first couple trophic levels, being much higher in biomass than the upper levels. Um, you can see this whale has what's called a baleen. A baleen is actually kind of like a series of teeth, but it's like a fine tooth comb that actually filters out the water. So what this thing is doing is it's going and scooping out huge amounts of water that contain plankton. Um, it's filtering out that plankton and using that. Now you've, you've got this huge animal that is able to support a really large body size because it's feeding off of the first trophic level in the environment, this photosynthetic plankton that it's scooping up. Sometimes they eat krill, which would be a, a second level uh, trophic level organism. So these things are not following this normal trend where generally body size gets larger the higher up you go in the food chains. This is something where it's able to go and use the lower level food chains, um, or the, excuse me, the lower level trophic levels to be able to get lots and lots of energy and lots and lots of biomass, which is why you have such a large animal doing this. Also worth mentioning several different feeding styles here. Substrate feeders are animals that literally eat their way through the environment. You can see this caterpillar here leaving this little trail of poop behind it as it's going and eating its way through this leaf. Um, it's strange for us to think of because our food is so small, but in this case, the food is absolutely huge. It's like having a hamburger the size of a house and just eating a little you know, person-shaped hole through the entire thing, leaving a trail of poop behind you. This is a substrate feeder. They feed on their substrate, the stuff that they are living in. Now, when we were going and talking about the different phyla, one of the things we mentioned with arthropods is that they've got really flexible mouth parts. And here we see a great example of that. This is a fluid feeder, this mosquito. Um, well, actually, mosquitoes are a bad example of that because mosquitoes don't actually feed actively on the blood. It's used in reproduction, rather. Uh, but in this case, a fly that's going and actually sucking blood from another animal is an example of a fluid feeder. You can see some of these well-adapted mouth parts in this picture here kind of puncturing into the skin. Um, fluid feeders. And of course, there are lots of types of animals that don't follow this normal pattern of like a tube within a tube, you know, a complete digestive tract with a, a mouth and the digestive tract and then the anus. Here we can see a sponge definitely feeding in, different, in a different sort of way, not really a tube within a tube body layout. It's actually going and using its body to filter out the water in the environment and collect food. Um, same with the hydra in this example as well, uh, going and capturing little bits from the environment, uh, breaking it down. And again, if you look at those little wormy looking uh, tentacles and then the cells lining the inside of the hydra's body, I hope you're thinking structure and function right now. Long skinny cells, you are absorbing the food particles. In this case, that little tiny water flea or what we call daphnia is the food. So breaking that thing down. Now, you're going to find that digestive tracts follow a couple of basic trends. Um, the more cellulose, the more rough plant matter in the environment, generally speaking, the longer the digestive tract has to be. That is something that's very difficult for a lot of animals to be able to break down. This buffalo that we see in this picture uh, has got an absolutely enormous uh, digestive tract. Look at that entire central uh, rumen and reticulum, all of these different little chambers inside there. These house bacterial colonies. These are different structures that actually have lots and lots of different species of bacteria and archaeans that are going to help break down that cellulose and actually release the energy that it contains. So this stomach is really acting as like just a gigantic fermentation pot where these prokaryotic colonies are working to release the energy in the cellulose and break it down into the environment, or excuse me, into the animal, into the environment. What am I saying? My gosh. Okay. So here we can see a cross-section of an intestine. Now look at the interior of that tube, the lumen. Do you notice how the sides of that is covered in this mucousy material? 
All right, we can see the mucosa right there. Now that is secreting mucus. It is not mucus itself, but that's an actual tissue layer that's used for not only secreting digestive enzymes, but also absorbing nutrients as well. The other thing that I want to point out to you here is we have multiple muscle sheets, some of them running the length, and then some of them acting as kind of like a an opposing muscle group that are running in a ring around this. What this allows the intestine to be able to do is to contract and expand, moving the chyme or the digestive fluid within it. So your intestines do actively move, okay? They, they actively push food through them to try to go and release as many nutrients as we can, taking advantage of the massive surface area of the inside of the intestine lining. Uh, lining. All right, so a generalized digestive tract in this slide. Okay, you can see that we've got all of these little accessory organs. Those are the things in green here, the salivary glands, the gallbladder, the liver, and the pancreas. They are not ones that lie on the direct line. In other words, food does not pass through them. However, they do secrete important digestive enzymes, and they play very important roles in being able to go and grab all of the nutrients and energy that your food has. So food, of course, going from the mouth to the esophagus, to the stomach, to the small intestine, to the large intestine, to the rectum, and eventually, again, it gets pooped out the anus, of course. So we can see the small intestine comes first here. Uh, we will take a look at some closer anatomical views in a second. But again, what you should be remembering off the slide is that the accessory organs, and don't forget about them, they do not lie directly on the line where the food is passing through. They're involved in secreting different materials uh, that are used to help digest that food. Okay, so the basic overall human digestive system here. Now notice, first off, probably the most noticeable thing in this whole thing, at least in my eye, is the large intestine. Okay, kind of swings up across. Um, you can literally see it uh, kind of arching its way from the left-hand side all the way across the top to the right-hand side, um, and then eventually gets kind of uh, leading down to the rectum and the anus. So... All of these organs are important ones to know. Your liver's, of course, sitting on top of this. Your liver is one of your largest individual organs, aside from the ones that span your entire body, like your skin, for example. Uh, you can see the stomach sort of tucked underneath the liver right there. The pancreas is also sitting right about there, of course, important in producing uh, lots of different digestive enzymes as well as um, insulin. Okay. So these macromolecules, when they're broken down, this is going to look a lot like chapter two and three stuff here for a second or two because we're looking at our old friend hydrolysis, a water molecule being put in between these polymer chains that are used to split apart. And remember, this is just a chemistry thing here, but we're splitting apart these polymers. So this is the actual chemical process of digestion. Notice the bottom set too. What we're doing is we're taking a triglyceride here. That's a fatty uh, a series of fatty acid chains hooked up to a glycerol group. We're going and putting in three waters, and it breaks apart the fatty acid chains. It restores that uh, carboxylic acid right at the end right there, and then you've got your glycerol molecule kind of floating free so that you can go and put those atoms towards something else if you wish. All right, I'll leave this up on the screen for just a second or two so you can look through this. This is just something that kind of goes through all of the different enzymes that are involved in digestion of different types of macromolecules. Got carbohydrate digestion, protein digestion, nucleic acid digestion, and fat digestion. Let's take a brief look at teeth. Teeth can actually tell you an awful lot about what something is eating. Notice the uh, herbivore on the right-hand side. This is a sheep skull. First off, we've got a small set of front teeth in the beginning there used for picking grass and picking these uh, plants off of, or leaves off of plants. Um, and then the back teeth, the molars, are really just used to uh, grind up. They're almost like large flat grinding plates used to be able to mash up this really rough plant material in this thing's diet so that it's able to go and swallow that and hopefully um, digest that effectively. Remember, this is also going to have a very large fermentation pot style uh, digestive tract, one that is going to be uh, filled with all sorts of different types of bacteria to help it break down that tough to digest cellulose. Okay, you can see the omnivores were kind of the example for that. Um, multi-purpose set of teeth. The molars are definitely good for grinding. The fronter teeth can be a little bit sharper. It is all a bit more compact. And when you compare it with the carnivore, you're going to notice a couple of really big differences. First off, the carnivore teeth are really kind of all about the canines in a way, aren't they? I mean, look at those things. Those huge little horns kind of sticking out here. I can attest to it. I just got bit by my cat the other day, and they are darn sharp. These things are used for hunting. They're used for going and capturing prey and delivering a deadly blow 
um, at that point, then the cat starts to kind of slowly eat it once it's killed its prey. So carnivore teeth, distinctly different from omnivore teeth, distinctly different from herbivore teeth. Bears' teeth and lions' teeth, they are not the same. Okay, bears are omnivores, lions are are carnivores, of course. So you can see the predictable differences in their teeth. All right. Now, in humans, of course, we have a salivary gland. The saliva plays an important role in breaking down some types of sugars, actually. That's one of the roles of sal salivary amylase, actually. Um, saliva also is important in helping to sterilize your food. There are certain types of bacteria that are actually killed by human saliva. Um, and of course, it just adds lubrication. So you're able to go and swallow your food mixtures more easily. You can imagine eating some really dry food. You've got to go and have lots of saliva being given off as you're going and chewing that up, just so you can get the stuff down. So let's talk about the actual process of swallowing. Here's peristalsis. Peristalsis is kind of a contraction of the, um, the esophagus itself that's involved in swallowing. So what's happening here is this contra set of contractile rings lining the, the uh, esophagus. Once you swallow, it starts to, and I'm sitting here mimicking on my computer as if my computer is able to see what I'm doing. Um, what's actually happening is this thing is like contracting right at the top, and then it literally contracts this this contractile ring squeezes the food bolus the the bolus is kind of like the chewed up lump of food all the way down the esophagus into the stomach that is this process called peristalsis it's kind of a continuous retraction that moves the food bolus down the esophagus so any ringed muscle is referred to as a sphincter. There are a couple in the digestive tract that are worth mentioning. We have the cardiac and pyloric sphincters. The pyloric sphincter is a contractile ring of muscle right at the base of the stomach. It leads to the small intestine. The opening of the small intestine we refer to as the duodenum, actually surprisingly common word in medical science. Now you'll notice that top ring, it's, it's labeled in this diagram as the gastroesophageal junction. That's the cardiac sphincter. Why is it called cardiac if it's not in your heart? It's not too far from your heart, but that is the cardiac sphincter. Here's the inside of a stomach. You can see the pyloric sphincter down there at the bottom. Five is pointing to it. Notice all the interior folds. These are called rugae. Lots of surface area for secretion of acids. Now the actual lining of a stomach is really all about secretion. So notice we've got a couple different cells here at the bottom of the diagram that are creating things. We have chief cells and parietal cells. So you can see these parietal cells are going and secreting hydrogen ions and chlorine ions, which are joining together to make HCl. Now, that HCl interacts with the thing that the chief cells is giving off. It's giving off something called pepsinogen. You take pepsinogen, you mix it up with this acid, and what it does is it actually makes this active form of the pepsinogen enzyme called pepsin. And that's the stuff that is able to go and actually start to digest specifically proteins. You might put that together there, peptides. Remember, peptide is kind of one of these words that indicates or should like set off an alarm that we're talking about a protein here. The peptide bonds are broken by pepsin, okay? Peptide bonds broken by pepsin. Your stomach does actively churn your food. You can see these peristaltic waves, your stomach contracting and mixing back and forth. Notice how the shape of the stomach is going and changing in this diagram from one to the next. And it's just mixing up the food. It is literally there to be mixing up the chyme. Chyme is a food digestive fluid mixture. Once your boluses make it down to the stomach, they get mixed up in the digestive fluid. We refer to that from that point on as chyme. And it's going to stay that way, by the way, through the small intestine into the large intestine. All right, let's take a quick stop at the liver. The liver is an incredibly important organ. It does an awful lot of different jobs in the body, as it turns out, but one of the big things that it does to contribute to the digestive tract is it's evolved in manufacturing bile. Now, that is stored in the, or excuse me, carried through the hepatic duct is what it's called, stored in the gallbladder. Now, this is something that's really important in breaking up fats, Okay, bile is something that's used as an emulsifier. It's used to break up the fats, even if you're in an aqueous HCL solution like the digestive juices inside your stomach. So it's very important in being able to break down fats because fats otherwise would not be able to be broken down by the aqueous digestive fluid uh, inside the stomach. So 
Here we can see a, a dissection where we can see some of these uh, organs. So just to point out the obvious stuff, the heart is number eight, the lungs are number seven. This big umbrella looking sheet, and it's number nine right there, um, is the diaphragm muscle. Okay, and then underneath we can start to see a couple things sort of popping out here. The liver is just barely visible. If you were to pull back that diaphragm though, it would be big and unnoticed, or excuse me, big and, and unmissable. You would not be able to help but notice it. It's huge. Um, all right, take a look around. Notice we do have some fat deposits on the inside too. That's the yellowish stuff. The stuff that is on the outside of your chest cavity is not nearly as harmful as the stuff that's on the inside. The stuff on the inside is the stuff that really causes damage for you. Here's another shot of some of these organs down in the lower digestive tract. You can see the large intestine sort of moving its way up. That's number four in this diagram. The small intestine is number six. The descending colon, number 13, and the transverse colon, uh, number three. Okay, again, you can see the diaphragm in this diagram is at number five, kind of cut away here in this shot. Uh, the liver is much more visible at, at number 14. And notice we've got a kind of a slightly distended stomach actually sticking out right here at number 15. Okay, it's kind of swollen. All right, so we've got the liver, of course. That's kind of what's majorly featured in this. Notice we have the gallbladder peeking out. That's number six right underneath there. So the liver is really on feature in this one. Um, this is something that's uh, really used, again, for a lot of different things in the body. Not only is it going into helping to manufacture bile, it is playing a very important role in enzymatically breaking down toxics, uh, excuse me, toxins like alcohol, like different types of medications, any foreign substances you're taking in as part of your food. Your liver is the organ that has the job of doing that. Because of that, it's one of the organs that is also able to repair itself rather efficiently. A lot of your organs, once you do damage, they're kind of just stay damaged. The liver, not as much. Now, that you can definitely push things too far. Uh, take liver cirrhosis with an alcoholic, for example. But by and large, the liver is one of the organs that actually has a relatively strong ability to be able to repair itself. It's pretty impressive stuff. So, you can see... This thing is also responsible for making and storing glycogen. Remember, glycogen is that branching carbohydrate compound used for storage. Uh, your muscles will also go and store some of that. It's used for breaking down nutrients in your digestion. In this slide, we can see the gallbladder. It looks like that kind of greenish thing sitting there underneath the liver. The stomach is also right there, of course, number 12. Okay, very large stomach here. Okay. So here's the bottom side of the liver. There's a couple things that are worth mentioning to you. Number one is the gallbladder. Kind of still has that greenish tint to it. The common bile duct at number four, the inferior vena cava, and the aorta running right through here. So lots and lots of blood moving through this thing. As it turns out, this is very, very important that we keep this well-fed and well-connected to the circulatory system so that it can do its job in detoxifying blood. Think about the pathway of a toxin here. You, you go and, you know, drink a glass of wine. You are taking in toxins as you do that. The toxin in this case is ethanol. So that ethanol goes from your stomach and your small intestine into your bloodstream very quickly, by the way. And then from your bloodstream, it's going to get filtered through the liver. And the liver is going to work like crazy to try to break that stuff down as quickly as it can. Alcohol dehydrogenase, if I remember correctly, is the enzyme that does that. So the more of this you do... Uh, the more your liver sort of gets itself in shape by creating larger amounts of uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is involved in detoxifying your bloodstream. Um, so people that are addicts or that have a problem with alcoholism oftentimes have got very large amounts of smooth endoplasmic reticulum in their liver cells, and that is a clue, physiologically speaking, that somebody was doing an awful lot of one particular substance. So here we can see bile produced by the liver, breaking down fats. I say it acts like a detergent. What I mean by that is that it's acting in a way that allows it to be able to go and dissolve the fats and the oils that we're going and taking in in our diet so that they can go and actively dissolve into the digestive fluids and be broken down. Again, this is all about trying to get something that does not want to dissolve in water to dissolve in water. And that's what bile does. It acts like a detergent. You could see in the side of a can of detergent that, you know, it cuts through the grease. Well, that's how it works. It goes and actually one side of the molecule dissolves hydrophobic molecules like fats and greases. The other side of the detergent molecule actually interacts with polar molecules like aqueous solutions, water-based solutions. So... The enzyme that's responsible for breaking down fats is something called lipase. 
which makes sense. It's breaking down lipids. So remember, we oftentimes end enzymes in this ASE. So lipase is responsible for that. And here's our old friend hydrolysis again, breaking down that triglyceride into its three fatty acid chains, releasing the glycerol so that it can be absorbed. All right, there are some physiological problems that can certainly happen along the way here. Gallstones are surprisingly common. It's when calcified stones start to build up in the gallbladder, and they can get caught, and they can cause all sorts of problems. Um, so this is something that can be very, very bad for the gallbladder. Uh, there certainly are pancreatic stones as well, which can be uh, problematic, of course. So here is an actual pancreas. You can see the pancreatic duct in this slide leading down to the duodenum. Remember, that's the opening of the small intestine. So... The pancreas is used to make buffer. Now, when we talk about buffer, what I'm talking about here is a substance that is neutralizing the low pH of the stomach acid. So, in the small intestine, if the pancreas is doing its job correctly, it should be much closer to a neutral solution than it is in the stomach. It's not nearly as acidic. It is releasing insulin, of course, which is hormones for blood sugar, and then lots and lots of enzymes that it's going to help break down that food and further digest in the small intestine. The small intestine has an enormous absorbing surface to it. Look at that middle little picture right there where it shows all of the intestinal folds and the villi. Uh, sitting there on the lining of the intestine, all about surface area for absorption of nutrients in this case. The small intestine goes through para peristalsis as well, kind of shifting and mixing food back and forth to try to make it so that you can go and, and mix up different waves of food and different waves of digestive fluids and enzymes um, so that you can break down your food more effectively. You can see the breakdown of a starch in this case. Here's more hydrolysis. Hey, look, here's more hydrolysis. Now we're breaking down proteins into component amino acids. It's all over the place. And when I say that the liver is well connected with the rest of the uh, circulatory tract, I mean it. Look at these, all of these vein connections inside of here. And notice, these are not little side veins. This is connected to like the aorta. Okay, and the hepatic portal vein literally runs right through the middle of this thing, feeding the entire liver. Notice how that all connects to the stomach and the small intestine too. Okay, these are all used to be able to dump energy into the bloodstream. It is very important that all these systems are in place so that you can get proper absorption of nutrients and get those nutrients into the bloodstream right away. So that when you feel a little hangry, you haven't had anything to eat, feels like your blood sugar is a little low, you go and eat something, and it doesn't take long for that sugar to actually hit your system. This digestion happens quickly, and that stuff is able to hit your bloodstream within a matter of minutes. Okay, you can see some liver circulation kind of highlighted in the slide, and yeah, there is a lot of abdominal fat in this particular slide. This fat is going to cause this person health problems, or I'm sure it did. Anyways, sorry, that was really morbid. Gross. Anyways, small and large intestine. Um kind of highlighted for you in this slide. Notice we have the appendix also highlighted here. Looks like this little thing sort of hanging off the end of the uh, cecum right there, which is the end of the, or the beginning of the small, or the, excuse me, I can't talk, beginning of the large intestine. Um, the appendix sometimes will get inflamed. Uh, that is, by the way, the evolutionary remnant of an organ that's actually used uh, in vegetarian animals uh, and herbivores uh, to go and house large colonies of bacteria that are involved in breaking down rough plant matter like this koala bear over there as you can see okay that's something that's got a very large cecum left behind on it the appendix is the remnants of the cecum we do not really use it for much anymore except i believe there's a phase in fetal development where it actually houses important bacterial colonies aside from that it is more or less uh, an organ that is unused today okay so the large intestine then is involved in getting rid of excess water and feces. Feces, yeah, we're talking about poop here, is actually mostly bacteria. You know, when you look at what this stuff is actually made of, it's like 60% bacteria by mass. The job of the small intestine is to move this stuff through and to make sure that this uh, feces has got the correct mix of fluids on the inside right here. You can see we do this by controlling the way that bicarbonate and potassium and sodium and chloride are all moved in and out to be able to maintain proper levels of water balance. So the fluid moving into the large intestine is very watery. It's chyme. But the stuff that comes out should be somewhat solid, at least more solid than it was uh, before. So... The timing through the large intestine is really important because you've got to make sure that you have um, the correct level of water balance being pulled out. You don't want it in there too long. You don't want it uh, obviously moving out too quickly. Otherwise, it's uh, very fluidy. And of course, when you get sick and you're having stomach problems, you might experience a little bit of that. And that's all I'm going to talk about that because it's gross.
timing of digestion. Notice it takes an awfully long time to make it through this entire series. Okay, why is the pH so low in the stomach? Well, you've got to kill off bacteria that are in your food, don't you? You've got to chemically break down some of the food in your stomach, don't you? That requires a low pH. Okay, there are hormonal controls of the digestive tract that are very important in making the correct enzymes at the right time. If you drink a milkshake, you don't necessarily want to be making the wrong enzymes or the wrong stuff. So there are hormones that regulate appetite as well. And this is really all just about making sure that you're not taking in too much or too little of any one thing. Of course, you can get sick and that will throw off all sorts of things. But to look at a few other examples of things that can go wrong with the digestive tract, here's a femoral hernia, a hernia right next to the femur. Um, you'll notice actually a bit of the small intestine kind of poking through. From what I understand, this is very painful, although I've never had it happen to me, thank goodness. Um, here's something called uh, diverticulitis. You, you'll notice right here that the uh, person probably hasn't been getting enough cellulose in their diet, and you can see these little bulbs filled with feces actually kind of popping off the side of the large intestine, and that is actually a big problem. They literally have to go in and clip those things off. It is not a pleasant treatment and not a pleasant disease, I'm sure. So here are hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are when some of the blood vessels lining the anus are inflamed and aggravated. Um, that can happen if somebody's not eating enough uh, fiber in their diet and they're having to push too hard when they're going number two. Um, and you can actually see some of the external hemorrhoids uh, coming out of there. From what I understand, these are also very, very, very painful. So when you're eating a proper diet, you have got to account for the other eight amino acids that we are not able to biosynthesize ourselves. So if you're a vegetarian and you're not eating large amounts of meat or animal protein, it's important that you be eating a mixture of foods and a variety of foods to make sure that you're getting plenty of all of the amino acids that you're able to that you, that you need to be consuming from the environment. You'll notice legumes have got some but not all, grains have got some but not all. So really, again, variety is the key to a healthy diet. You can see the food pyramid here in all of its glory. I'm not going to talk too much about this. I think we'll be done now. I hope you guys all have a wonderful day. Bye.